So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, um, uh, it's spurred by my interest in in uh, in suburbia and in the restructuring of suburbia uh, and try that to connect it with another strand of research that I've been doing uh, over the last ten years, namely the role of architecture and especially the the social ambitions and uh, um, social intentions and also the instrumentality of architecture in creating communities. Um, so I saw this as an opportunity to kind of look back in time uh, since uh, this event is having a, or at least this part of the event is having a kind of historical perspective. Um, and I should really say that this is not, um, uh, this presentation is not a result of an uh, thorough research. It's more um, a kind of first step into uh, a research theme, uh, which I would like to uh, to focus more on. So I'm going to look at um, the kind of centralities and communities that were uh, built up um, during the 1950s, 60s and 70s uh, in the Oslo region. Um, you could call it new towns, satellite towns, uh, um, um, and and the role of uh, of architecture and the social ambitions of architecture. Um, so I'm taking as a starting point uh, a master plan that was uh, uh, launched in 1950, which really, you know, compared to many other plans, which are overall comprehensive master plans that are not really. Uh, put into work or that really doesn't have the effect that was uh, intended. This plan was really implemented and changed the landscape of Oslo for good. Um, so uh, it singled out specific areas for, for development, new satellite towns, and also created a polycentric city region. Um, so I'm, in this talk, I'm going to focus on, on the role of so-called social architecture. I'm going to say a bit more of how I uh, understand uh, the term social architecture in the imaginations and making of these new towns uh, and also discuss the role of social architecture relating to the critique of, uh, uh, of uh, satellite towns, new towns uh, uh, that I guess you're all familiar with, uh, these kind of large-scale housing estates from the 1960s and, and uh, 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, and and the kind of conception of failed placemaking, and then at the end I will just uh, describe a, some kind of theoretical trajectories or, or tracks to follow. Uh, at least what I would like to focus more on related to social architecture. So, what is the concept of social architecture? In in a way, it's a kind of um, uh, an attempt to relaunch. Um, Currently, it's an attempt to relaunch uh, the issue of the social and the issue of community, social sustainability in architecture. Um, um, and I think um, in some ways it's, it's kind of um, looking at architecture as an instrument for social purposes. So it could be like trying to create communities through architecture, for example, in what kind of building type, what kind of designs uh, uh, are made. Uh, it could also be about promoting and inhibiting specific social practices. So um, there are many examples of uh, exclusionary architecture, um, which has a, uh, also a social effect. Um, sometimes it's part of state-led programs for development and redevelopment, like I'm going to exemplify. Um, and social architecture has also been criticized for architectural determinism, that is to, to, uh, to um, put too much weight on the role of architecture in social processes. Um, so just in the right there, the images are two examples that I, it's, it's quite interesting that the titles are the same in my view. So um, um, uh, the, the quite famous uh, international architect uh, Jan Geer, who's focused on the life between buildings um, and everyday life and relation between architecture and people and their practices, um, but which, which is also criticized for, for lacking the kind of the political social context uh, and issues of uh, social justice and so on, which I will come back to. Uh, and then there's uh, 
the Norwegian art, artist uh, Pushwagners, who actually has made a collection, a kind of uh, imaginative narrative, which is a kind of a, uh, a ironic critique of the city um, um, uh, and his concept, soft city. Um, so, uh, um, and then I, I also I also want to kind of um, hook onto the recent or the the, the current uh, so-called social turn in architecture. So um, uh, a bit of inspired by an article and a series of papers in a themed issue by Richter Goebel and Gurbauer about the, uh, this so-called social turn in architecture, which is um, in many ways at least a discursive turn um, so the social is is um, is um, um, part of a, a new direction in architecture rhetorically um, uh, and they argue that it's mostly small scale experimental projects and very different from the kind of projects that I'm going to mention in just a couple of minutes uh, and they also argue that it it's kind of decontextualized uh, in relation to the kind of dominating order of the neoliberal political economy. Uh, so that's a bit of background uh, when it comes to the concept of social architecture. So my case is the master plan for Oslo and uh, the satellite towns developed uh, from 1950 and onwards until it stopped uh, early in 1970s. So, um, since you know everybody knows everybody knows New York and London, but nobody knows about Oslo, <laughs> so I'm just going to give you a, a bit of information about Oslo. So um, Oslo is the capital of Norway. Uh, Norway is a country of only five million inhabitants uh, in the outskirts of uh, of Europe. Um, the city uh, of Oslo has within its municipalities a bit above six hundred thousand inhabitants. The urban region or the kind of continuous built up uh, um, environment of Oslo has approximately 1 million inhabitants. Um, um, and the city has kind of, uh, it's approximately a thousand years old, um, but it really grew in the 1800s and 1900s uh, and has lately until COVID uh, really uh, had a quite, ex um, uh, um, explosive growth, uh, which has kind of caused, for example, the rise in housing prices, uh, kind of similar challenges that we have in many other cities. Um, so um, the area that I'm focusing is um, the one that is in the right of the picture. Could you see my cursor, my marker? Uh, so this area is called the Grover Valley, which um, has um, approximately um, 100,000 inhabitants today. So this was transformed from a mainly agricultural land with small villages into um, um, a network of satellite towns uh, from the 1950s and onwards. There were also other satellite towns, but the, and today this area is kind of, um, looked upon as, uh, as an area with a lot of social and socioeconomic challenges. Um, so that's also a backcloth of this uh, uh, talk. So these are two examples from this period. Uh, first, the first uh, satellite town was Lambesetter, which was finished in 1950, uh, which is described as within the terms of architecture as a kind of pragmatic functionalism. So this was, inspired by the, the trend of modernism and functionalism, but uh, uh, on with a kind of um, uh, local scale uh, um, and, and also a local expression. So it's, it's not that monumental as much other um, modernist architecture. And this changed uh, during the period of developing these satellite towns, the architectural strategies uh, and also the use of prefabricated element changed the, the landscape quite dramatically. So, so in the bottom picture is Amru, which was one of the last satellite towns developed, which has, a, as you can see, these really huge um, blocks of flats, um, which is typical for Amru, even if it has also other housing types. Um, uh, and this was 
designed by the chief architect Håkon Melva, which which was um, uh, uh, a part of a, a progressive an organization of progressive architecture, which really was linked to SIAM, which many of me you may know, uh, founded by Le Corbusier, uh, and um, which ideologically uh, um, promoted uh, um, uh, modernist architecture. So these are there are kind of approximately ten of these satellite towns in the Grudu Valley. Uh, these are two of the most uh, prominent. Uh, 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 places. So what were the social ambitions and the content of these places? I'm going to focus on that. There's lots of other things to be said about these satellite towns, but I'm going to say something about what what um, was intended um, uh, with respect to social architecture. Um, so at the start, this the, the, the reason for creating these satellite towns was because of a kind of social challenge or problem, namely the so-called housing problem that was uh, partly uh, caused by, um, uh, by um, there was a certain attention towards uh, housing problems in the central city uh, with, um, with lack of uh, services and facilities and also um, uh, working class slums that they wanted to relocate uh, uh, the working class into areas that, uh, that had a kind of higher standard of living. And the other challenge was the influx of people. So the, the city was growing after the Second World War. Um, uh, and to deal with that housing problem, uh, satellite towns was, uh, was the solution. Um, another aspect when it comes to the social is this is really not only a, a detailed planning of uh, physical structure and the restructuring of landscape, it was also really um, a detailed plan for the social structures and institutions. Um, so there were different housing types, but there were also schools, libraries, health services, shops, public transport system was important, parks, playing ground, grounds, etc. So the aim was to, to create towns uh, of um, approximately 10,000 inhabitants, um, um, more or less, uh, a bit varied between these towns. Um, and in many ways to establish what Eric Klinenberg in his book, Palaces for the People, has termed social infrastructure. Um, so a, an infrastructure to, to create, um, uh, to, to promote social relations and social capital and to create the kind of feeling of identity and belonging, um, but also to, to cater for everyday needs and so on. And what happened then with, with these places? So um, <clears throat> many of you are, I guess, familiar with uh, the fate of Prud Aigil, which is kind of incise, similar to, to uh, many of uh, these satellite towns in Oslo, because it had approximately, I think it was 2,000, 2,800, 2,900 units. Ammeru had approximately the same number of units. Um, and I think Pruitt Igo is kind of the extreme example of, uh, uh, of um, failure. Uh, it was built in the mid 1950s and demolished in the early 1970s. Uh, so a very short period of time, designed by the same architect as uh, a Japanese architect who designed the World Trade Center, actually. Um, uh, uh, so, and the, the reason for demolishing the, the whole project uh, of 33 identical units in the outskirts of St. Louis was, um, was uh, that it was more or less empty, a uh, lot of social problems, um, high crime rates, uh, and so on. Um, the situation in Oslo was quite different uh, for several reasons. I think one reason is the kind of structure and institutionalized uh, welfare state system, which provided, provided the kind of security net for people. Um, uh, so the, the, the kind of poverty wasn't that um, uh, marked in, in Oslo. Uh, another uh, reason is that most of the Norwegian satellite towns were quite varied in housing type. So in Prud Aigo, there were only blocks of flats and they were identical. Um, in in uh, Amru, for example, there were 
large blocks of flats, smaller blocks of flats. There were row houses and also uh, single family housing in the same area. So you would have a, also because of the mix of housing types, also uh, a mix of uh, people with different socioeconomic status, different uh, lifestyles and also life faces and, and families. Uh, but still, um, uh, these areas became debated and criticized. Um, so, for example, uh, there's a, um, an image here from a front page of a newspaper where an architect uh, uh, suggests to tear down, demolish the blocks at um, Amru, uh, which, interestingly enough, created uh, an outcry and, and um, uh, a, a huge response by the people living there. So, um, so this is also a kind of a, uh, another way of doing architectural determinism, not re uh, recognizing or acknowledging the people living there actually, and, uh, and have this kind of from the outside critique of, of, uh, of these places. Um, there were also some <clears throat> novels that, that describe uh, these, uh, uh, these places and there were films made um, so this was part of a kind of a critical discourse uh, of failed placemaking. Um, I see that I don't have too much time so I'm going to jump quickly through the next two images and come to the conclusion quite quickly. Um, uh, so I think that what we could learn from this is that uh, um, uh, is how to kind of deal with uh, the social aspects of architecture, how to theorize the social aspects of architecture is really important for our current planning ambitions. So I'm, I'm been looking at the regional plan for, for Oslo and, and the, the kind of new post-suburban centralities there. Uh, and I've also been looking at new types of um, uh, architecture or remaking these uh, satellite towns uh, to making them more environmentally and socially sustainable. For example, this one, uh, remaking architecture. Um, so this is my last slide. So what, what could be uh, some theoretical trajectories for, for, uh, for studying the relationship between architecture and the social? I think one important thing is to look at the kind of performative role of social architecture. So uh, architects have, are often quite ambitious on creating uh, communities cr uh, to kind of create specific social practices. Uh, so to look into that kind of process is, is important. Uh, uh, another aspect is how, um, how much of the architectural projects today, as criticized by, um, by, for example, Monica Grubauer, is kind of decontextualized. So there are experiments, there are uh, uh, ten uh, kind of um, uh, temporal urbanism projects uh, uh, at a very low scale, uh, which is kind of decontextualized uh, uh, in relation to the, the, to the larger context of the city. Um, and there's also a distinction between designing communities and involving communities, which needs to be theorized. Um, and uh, at a larger scale, I think the, the role of social architecture and especially the current turn in social architecture should be seen in relation to, to the larger issues of social class and conflict, which it seldom is because it focuses on small scale kind of artistic experimentation and uh, temporary urbanism projects, um, uh, instead of looking at how, what the role of architecture could be uh, in relation to, to uh, issues of the city as a whole. Uh, so I think it's important to, to look at the role of social architecture, how it's formed today, uh, learn from the history as well, and uh, relate it to important issues uh, concerning social justice, uh, either the procedural aspects, for example, involving communities, recognitional aspects, uh, what are the actors uh, that are affected by these kind of architectures, and at last and not least, the distributional aspects of uh, social justice. So thank you. That was all. Excellent, Pierre Gunnar. Thank you so much. Um, really interesting uh, in terms of looking at the kind of, I suppose, the morphologies there that you, that you uh, depicted in terms of in Oslo with those kind of suburban environments. 
uh, and some of the ideas that myself and Roger in particular have been kind of discussing around about suburbs being kind of seen as bland scapes. But I think what you highlighted there are actually a move to blend scapes in suburbia, both in terms of morphology and also their social character and so forth. So, um, so excellent. Thank you very much. Um, going to open it up to uh, our guest attendees, if you've got any kind of questions or, or indeed comments that you'd like to uh, pose to uh, Pierre Gunner. Andrew, you had a question or comment? Hi, uh, thanks, Per. So, um, actually, mine and Mark's talk is is actually across the sea from Oslo. Uh, so, you know, and some of the architecture is quite similar. So, there's definitely a sort of like a north and west, northwestern European thing going on there because it's quite similar. Um, Pru, you mentioned Pru Igo. Um, Pru Igo before it was demolished, I think the majority of the re residents were African-Americans and women. And I'm just wondering, in Oslo, it's my understanding that in the peripheries of Scandinavian cities, that's kind of where a lot of asylum seekers um, are kind of punted. So I'm just wondering uh, uh, what considerations you've given to how your architecture today intersects with issues of um, race and, and gender and so on. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I think, um, uh, the period, period that I've been looking at now, uh, from 1950s to 1970s, there were very few immigrants in these areas. So the, the few Im immigrants <clears throat> and later on asylum seekers that were living in Oslo, they lived in the inner eastern parts of Oslo. So I think that's a difference a bit from city to city. So for example, Stockholm has for a long time had a much larger concentration of uh, of uh, immigrants and asylum seekers in the uh, outskirts and the suburban areas. But this has changed in Oslo. So this area of 100,000 inhabitants uh, is, um, is very much today inhabited by uh, immigrant uh, populations. Uh, some of these satellite towns uh, will have like 70-80% um, uh, uh, non-Western immigrants and also uh, the schools will have a large share of that. So, uh, so that is that picture has really changed because of increased immigration and because of uh, the um, suburbanization of the immigrant population in uh, in Oslo. So that makes these places very exciting. You know, there is uh, because these places are really multicultural places. Uh, um, uh, uh, so um, any any kind of research on these places today have, of course, to, to relate to the fact that these are really multicultural places. So there's not, there's people from all over the world. If I could abuse my position as chair and just actually follow up on Andrew's question. I'm, Peregrine, I'm just wondering if, if that multiculturalism is steeping into, um, I suppose, academic training and education and planning and architecture and then also in practice in the sense that there is a there's a multicultural aesthetic and knowledge informing planning and architecture practice given this diversity that's emerged well uh, i think uh, that the architectural profession in uh, in norway and in oslo uh, that's my kind of critique of it, is that they haven't really acknowledged that um, that multiculturalism. So at, at, at they, in my view, they're quite, and that's part of the problem with today's architecture, it's kind of decontextualized in relation to a lot of societal aspects, um, aspects of social justice and the things I mentioned at the end, which is both the kind of theoretical avenues for doing research, but also uh, a critique of today's architecture. Uh, so they're kind of insensitive to this variation, although there are lots of young architects that uh, that try to to uh, to create a kind of a new uh, type of architecture which is more sensitive. But it's often at a very kind of experimental, small scale uh, uh, type of projects instead of uh, dealing with the the larger issues. Uh, I would say. 